Okay, this is just background stuff that shows the vehicle on the pad. Uh, this shows Bob Tripton uh, getting ready to fly, and uh, there's me. And uh, you can see my big project the week before flight was uh, getting a bigger United States flag put on our pressure suit. <laughs> and the reason for that was uh, one of these bureaucrats told me that it had to be a small flag to balance the space shuttle program, and I pointed out to him that the United States was bigger than the space shuttle program. <laughs> This shows us uh, in the van, the traditional van that had been carrying Apollo crews out uh, that we rode out and going into the white room of the vehicle. Everybody had to wear those little masks theoretically for our last week there so that uh, we wouldn't contaminate them or something. They found that nobody at the cave got sick from us <laughs> being around them. <laughs> this is uh, setting up the hatch uh, just prior to launch and that's a Don said it gets kind of lonely out there. This is high speed ignition of the, the uh, three main engines. The vibration in the cockpit was very low at this time uh, after the engines light off. The instruments just a little blurred, but you could read every one of them. Look at those babies come up to speed. What this is this? The cockpit shows how the vehicle moves back and forth there. And this is high speed photography of the bolts blowing and the solid rocket motors lighting off. And all that this uh, water spray right there where they're trying to keep things cool and not having much luck. And this is very high speed photography. Because when it lit off, there was a couple of thumps and we started moving up very slowly. These are high, these are, look at these beautiful shocks coming out of the main engine at liftoff. And it's moving a lot faster now. This shows how close it comes to the inner tank access arm, which has always worried me some. It's really getting up and going. John and I expected a real hard kick in the pants. Uh, there shows that what it looked like out John's window. Call tower clear right from the cockpit. But it's actually a really very smooth liftoff with very little shaking associated with it. There's the road program to head us out over the ocean. And the vehicle is, uh, the cockpit vibration is such that you can still read all your instruments in there in uh, maybe it's uh, maybe 10 cycles per second. This shows the road program from inside the cockpit out the side window and it's uh, a thing of beauty. It's just as smooth as glass. There's no accelerations involved. And this shows the, the vehicle speed uh, picking up. It's probably about ready to go supersonic right now, almost going straight up. And uh, we said that's what it's going to do, but I didn't really believe it would, but it did. <laughs> we were uh, getting a little lost on our trajectory here that we're still analyzing right now. Also, I was seeing some debris coming off uh, from up over the nose that was coming back and uh, hitting the windscreen and going over the top of the vehicle that uh, we weren't sure what it is, uh, like ice or soapy, uh, that's the uh, stuff on the external tank that they're still analyzing. I believe that tail is about uh, 750 feet long, maybe uh, you can see it better from here, uh, maybe six, 700 feet long, maybe uh, 150, 200 feet wide. It's really impressive. I'm glad we couldn't see that. <laughs> Thank goodness for no rearview mirror. The ride was, was very smooth throughout this. Up in the uh, transonic phase, it took just a little bit there coming through max Q. This is uh, a camera inside the, extra, uh, inside the orbiter from the ET doors and shows the external solid rocket motor separation. Isn't that a spectacular shot? And then we show it again from inside the cabin although the light is much brighter than this. The big splash across the windscreen. This shows that we never saw these pictures, but here's a picture of a separation outside uh, from high-speed cameras. And then that's terrific. Uh, from all board sensations, the only thing we really saw was uh, the flash of light and our normal avionic cues that we had dumped the solids. We did not see them go away, nor feel any jokes. We're less than 1G right after separation transverse cues, and this baby's just chugging along. And it's just as smooth as glass, that ride is. Here you see some particles coming by John's window, a uh, couple of white objects. There went one that uh, was indicative of the kind of stuff that we'd been seeing uh, throughout the uh, flight. This is uh, back in a, this is umbilical t separation back in that uh, view that we saw, and this is external tank separation. And it is a spectacular sight. That white particles you see there are ice uh, caused by the, the hydrogen freezing as it's coming out and perfectly nominal. There's the, uh, the hit fitting that goes up in the orbiter. There's the umbilical plate. And there's the tank. And as you can see, all this black material there, that's the way the soapy works. It chars and turns black. So there's a high heating area in there. 
and it really caught it. And there's another place that's sort of discolored up here toward the nose of the tank. It was supposed to have been a tumble valve actuates to start uh, the vehicle tumbling, uh, and it did not work. And it, from our standpoint, it gave us a, a much better view of the tank. You'll also see the nose uh, discolored. It almost looks like the nose is uh, it's got all the soapy gone from it because there's a, a sort of metallic color there, but that might be bright. Yeah, we're, we're not sure of that, and uh, people are analyzing that still. Uh, this is a scene of me uh, climbing, out of the, climbing out of the seat. Uh, all the operations associated with the seat and the seat while you're in zero G are um, much easier to handle than it is down here on Earth. I'm just stuffing the... Uh, the helmet in a, a little bag along with the glove so that we can, we can tuck them away. There's quite a few connections associated with that suit, but uh, it's no real problem to handle it all in zero G. In one G, we had a lot of problem with this helmet. It's always bumping into the hand controller and firing things there. You see it's up there out of the way. We it's finally got it right. That's some float snackling. I'm not going to tell you this picture was made right after we got into orbit because I don't think either one of us was that, that gutty, but we made it later on and then ran it backwards. <laughs> Actually, we did a suiting exercise while we were on orbit just to make sure that we could get the suits and get back in the seats uh, with no problem, and that's, uh, that's when we filmed it. This uh, is two TV cameras uh, mucked together. Uh, one on the left and one on the right shows the initial payload bay door opening. Uh, all of that went, went nice and smooth. You'll notice uh, the ohm pod coming into view right here. This is the first time we saw some, uh, some tiles missing off of the ohm spot. You notice the door kind of hesitates when it opens, too. It did this in a fixture on the ground, and they told us, well, that was due to the fixture. That's the way the door really works. The camera on the right is, is an aft camera looking forward. You can see the windows coming. The one on the, uh, on the left is a forward camera looking aft. Uh, all those, that door operations went uh, as smooth as it could be, which uh, I was mighty happy because I didn't particularly care about the thought of going outside and trying to, trying to do anything associated with them. This is a view, a pan in the outside that shows the radiators deployed out there. That's a beautiful, uh, beautiful shot with the t television. You can also see those radiators when you look out your forward windows, which uh, surprises us a little bit. This is uh, an ops. Uh, Mode 8, check out of the hand controller. You move it full throw, and then you read on the cathode ray tube, which is where I'm looking, uh, to see if the hand controller is working properly. And this is very exciting. A little bit of this will last you about six months. <laughs> <laughs> this shows a camera forward in the cockpit looking aft, and uh, with John coming out of the seat, uh, this is actually some TV stuff that we did for a status report. Pretty good. At indication of the kind of problems we have with some of our comm lines, which uh, you had to work pretty hard to make sure you didn't get tied up in those things. And we stayed tied up in them the whole flight. The government is now looking at wireless mics that I think will really improve the capability of the crew to operate. As you can see there, I'm having to hold mine uh, next to my mouth so I can talk to people. This is a shot down on our mid-deck storage area where we uh, had all of our stuff stowed, and uh, this was actually just after the press conference, or not press conference, after the conversation we had with the vice president. Uh, zero G is something else. That is uh, something that all of you should have an opportunity to experience. It is really fun. You know, if you could do that in your living room without breaking your leg, you sure would. <laughs> There's no problem trying to restrain yourself anywhere down there. I'm uh, in the process here of changing out one of our Lyle canisters, which is used to, uh, that we run the air through uh, take out all the CO2 and any contamination. It's a very easy job. We had a couple of troughs down there where we stow uh, Lyle canisters, and you could just put your legs down in there and kind of push them apart, and it restrains you very nicely. Look at this. Uh, it shows the mobility that we have down the mid deck. People thought we needed a restraint system to tie ourselves down in there. You don't need any of that. Now, watch this mobility that Bob has when he kicks off and goes up uh, to the top side. Boy, I'll tell you, if that isn't the neatest thing in the world. The thing about it is, you don't really go flying around. Uh, you, you need to move a little bit slowly, otherwise you'll end up banging into something. But uh, there's no problem controlling yourself any place you want to go. <laughs> try that Try that in one gravity and this, see where it gets you. see, I just was wearing my socks there. I never put any shoes on while you're on orbit. I don't like to when I'm in the house either, so. 
uh, it shows what the television show you out the window and shows what a great view those spectacular windows gave us. Here's another television view of the Earth. Now we're coming up to the reason I was glad I was flying with a guy like John that's got all the experience. We're getting ready to come home and uh, sitting beside a man that knows space testing like he does made you feel mighty good. We're shutting the doors and all of that again went just like uh, just like we wanted it to. It, uh, there were no problems at all associated with it. You can notice there's a little bit of jerky motion when it comes down. We were lowering the uh, starboard door down easy and you'll notice it bounces pretty good uh, which we're having to pass on to other following crews to make sure when they close it they can don't have any problem with overlap got her all tucked away and we're ready to come home now this uh had them stretch this picture because in the real world there was a beautiful pink up here due to the heat this is the first part of entry and uh there's the sunrise coming up and we're moving along at about 300,000 feet, and we're just about to 265,000 feet where we go in our first roll reversal. And you'll see that pretty shortly. Now, we're moving pretty fast, but not quite this fast. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first roll reversal. And here's the second roll reversal. It's done at Mach uh, 18 and a half, and this is at two frames a second. So we're moving six times faster than we would in, in the real world. Twelve times, maybe, yeah. Mach 18 and a half, and you really see those clouds go by even in the real in the real world, but it's not quite this fast. You the next roll reversal is at Mach 9.8. There it goes. We did the roll reversal a little bit slower than that, too. Yeah. <laughs> and here we come back at the 4.8 roll reversal. And that's Bakersfield out there, coming across the hatch in the, in the Sierras. And the vehicle sort of rolls wings level, and uh, this is about at 80,000 feet, and then we went to real-time photography, which is only twice as fast as happens in the real world, and as you can see, everything has slowed down quite a bit. We're pretty high right now, maybe 75, 80,000 feet coming across uh, the lake bed area that we told you all about. There's uh, China Lake up in that area up in there, and you can see that the, the left window. There's Cuddy back There's up at Old South Lake coming in to do it about right at the top. We're coming out to swing around the heading alignment circle, and uh, it sure is a beautiful view. Looking out that window, you can see everything you need to see. There was just no doubt in our minds that we knew exactly where we were in the flight, even uh, by comparing uh, what we had on our normal ground track with what we're seeing on the instrument. There's three sisters up there. The ride in up to this point uh, had been nice and smooth, and the vehicle control was really tight. It's a uh, nice handling space. Great plane going up there. And we're uh, getting ready to go in the turn around what we call our heading alignment circle. That's uh, the Mojave River, which is a, mainly a dry lake bed, a dry river bed out there. Uh, John is, in, is driving the vehicle at this, this point in time, and, uh, and it really handled nice. We were right down the middle of the corridor all the way. The remarkable thing about the space shuttle is it's all electric, and uh, the, when you move the wings somewhere, they stay there. You put the nose somewhere, and it stays there. It's just just an admirable handling vehicle. You couldn't ask for anything as, as responsive and as, uh, for this kind of a job, it does it exactly like you, you want it to. Couldn't have ordered a, a better day for coming back in. We could have navigated visually all the way from when we hit the coast, which was just a little less than Mach 7 up uh, south of the San Francisco area, all the way down to the San, San Joaquin Valley to the Edwards. There was no problem knowing where you were at any time. There's the highway. Uh, north of Edwards there and you swing across the lake bed and uh, it's kind of hard to see at first in these films but there's the old aim point right there. We're starting to come down the glide slope and the runway is uh, still hard to see there. We have some uh, aim lights that give you an indication of what your glide slope is out there that we refer to as taffy lights. Uh, we also had, uh, had locked on to a microwave landing system and all of those ended up agreeing right on as to where we were, no doubt whatsoever. Here's our old chase plane. He's flying back and forth across the bottom of the vehicle taking pictures uh, to see uh, if there's any tile damage uh, that would not show up. You know, they thought they might get some from the rocks and everything on the desert floor, so he's covering that right now. And chase plane did a real terrific job. The vehicle is very easy to control in this flight regime. We're about in the pre-flare right now. And I was flying about uh, 285 knots at this point. We're like about a 20 degree glide slope. Everything was just as smooth as could be. 
There's the, we're going into pre flare, and this time it looks out the window. You may be able to see two or three of those lights. Uh, two lights, two white lights is what we're looking for. There are two there. We start our pull up now, and there'll be uh, three. You'll see the third one come on. So we're on a 20 degree glide slope to pre flare, which means we can only land uh, right down here at the touchdown point. Here's the wheels coming down. The wheels really snap down fast. They much faster than what I anticipated. And there's a couple of big black marks you'll see coming up here pretty soon. Oh, there they are. That's the touchdown point. And here we go, boy. <laughs> what a machine. It didn't know about that. Supposed to land on the touchdown point. <laughs> but uh, actually... You should understand, John was not trying to touch down on the touchdown point. What we were trying to do was to find out what the real deceleration kick and, and touch down about on an airspeed, which was about 185 knots. And uh, all of the ALT flights and this one ended up landing landing long, which looks to us like we have uh, a little bit more lift capability than what, what had been predicted. And we rolled right up here so uh, Kennedy Space Center's uh, recovery team could get a hold of us and hook the cooling up as fast as possible. We rolled into the runway intersection. We did that on purpose, so we hardly used any brakes on this rollout. And there's the vehicle sitting, and she is the beauty. That's, uh, believe it or not, the weight of that vehicle right there is about a little, uh, right around 99 tons. I keep reading where it's uh, 150,000 pounds or 80 tons, but that one right there is 99 tons. That's quite a, quite a performance thing to put the return from orbit with 99 ton spacecraft in the Get her back all in one piece, I think. 